How's everyone doing today? Great. Great. This is a really nice turnout for a Sunday afternoon. So thank you so much for coming here. So has anyone heard any of my talks before? A couple of people. Okay. No. Um, so my talks are famous for being controversial. So um, who here is the designer in the room? Okay. Who's a photographer? Okay. Um, I'll probably annoy and piss off all of you. So just be aware of that. Um, but this talk is not your traditional technical talk. It's not a technical talk. But first of all, who am I? What am I doing? Why am I standing up here? My name is Mike Demo. Hey, I'm Mike Demo. Um, I'm an evangelist for Bold Grid. Um, I'm also the treasurer of Open Source Matters. Does anyone here know what Open Source Matters is? Got one person. It's the Joomla Foundation. Oh, how did he get in here? Call security. Here's the, here's the deal, guys. Tools are tools. I don't care what CMS you like. WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, <clears throat> etc. Use a tool you like. I use WordPress. I've made hundreds of WordPress sites. I love WordPress. I ask you to use Joomla. It's fine. It's okay. Because guess what? Open source is more important than what tool you prefer to use. <coughs> um, sponsorship manager of the Joomla World Conference. I'm also a husband, father, video game lover, um, and a former Disney cast member. And the closer I get to the coast, the less impressive that sounds. And I'm also the owner of a wonderful dog. You can see her up there. Her name is Volana. And you can see some pictures of me doing my WordPress evangelism at WordCamp EU and some other events out there, including going to a college, teaching people, college kids about WordPress. <coughs> and this is a picture from the SNAP conference. The SNAP conference is a DIY bloggers conference in Salt Lake City. I was one of only three men at this conference. Um, <laughs> it was a very interesting event. And those are professional male dancers dressed as unicorns. So, <laughs> yes, I... I uh, go to a lot of different types of events talking about WordPress and um, everything out there. Um, I also love WordPress because of the diversity. I love how inclusive this community is. I love how we all get along and pull the rope in the same direction. And I love how there can be people from different religious backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, political backgrounds, and other views. And I love how this community comes together. And even if we might not all agree about every single topic, um, we all are here for the love of WordPress and the love of open source. And that is why I'm here. Because WordPress is people and WordPress is really, um, the people is what drives this. This is an amazing event. I mean, this San Diego camp, hasn't this been an amazing weekend? It's been great. Um, and it's because of the people. It's one of the volunteer team, all the speakers, all the sponsors, um, everything out there. Um, if you are interested in Bold Grid, we have a booth out there. You can talk to me out there. But this talk's not about Bold Grid, um, and it's not really about open source. It's about ducks. Who here is, yes, yeah. uh, who here came because the talk had ducks in the title? You can be honest, it's okay. Um, this talk is about ducks, and we're going to get to the ducks in a little bit, and I promise. But this talk is about A-B testing, but this is also a talk that is interactive. I will throw things at you. <coughs> you laugh and you think I'm joking, but I'm not. Um, this is a talk where I'm going to ask the people to give me stories and ideas, and we're going to have a discussion, because this is a topic that a lot of people think There we go. This is a topic that a lot of people think is really complicated and all this stuff, but it's really not. I'm gonna, I have one major theme, and you'll, you'll get a catch on to it a little bit, and it is all about A-B testing, how you can make money on A-B testing. So, anyone here have any experience in split testing or A-B testing? Okay, do you care to give an example or, you know, of some of the experience you've had with it? Sure. Uh, last time I worked out, we were a, a media and publishing company, and so our um, version was case use um, for our um, articles as well as uh, purchase to magazines. So we would try out different plugins and uh, placements to use it. Cool. And did, overall, do you think it was successful the work you were doing with that? Yes. Awesome. Anyone here have an example of A-B testing that they feel was maybe not as successful? Anyone here have a story to tell? No? Okay. Um, that's excellent. Thank you so much. So basically, here's what a lot of people do with A-B testing, is they don't know what they're doing. They just change stuff, their results go up, 
They change more stuff, results go down, and they have no idea why. Or they change six things at a time. Or they're just throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. But here's the thing, is that A-B testing needs to be controlled. It just needs to be controlled. And we do that a lot of different ways. So when you use and doing your A-B testing, did you use any sort of tool um, like Optimizely or BWO or another plugin? Yeah, we use a product called ABK. ABK, okay, cool. Um, and there's lots of tools out there. So it needs to be a controlled test. As, does any of this sound familiar? Where you do a lot of changes and then you see your sales go up and you don't know why. Or the KPIs, you don't know why. Or they go down and then you change a lot more stuff. And then more results happen. And you really don't know why. Because people, when they do changes on their website, Pretty much just guessing. Who here, when they launch a new project, well, I should ask this, who here makes websites for other people? Okay. When you launch a website, who here puts in writing the goal of that site? Okay, two. Those people that raise their hands, is that goal binary? Will you be able to look a year later and say yes or no, did you meet that? No? It's. It, exactly. So, a lot of times it's like, oh, well, we want our result, uh, well, we want our website to do more, or get better, or do more sales. Here's the thing, guys, is you're just setting yourself up for failure. Has this ever happened to you? You launch a website, the client loves it. They think you are a superstar. They are so happy on your wonderful site. And then six months goes by, the honeymoon period's over, you ask to do additional work, and they're like, I'm like, hey, do you want to do this stuff? And they're like, eh, I don't know. The website's not doing as much as we thought, or we hoped, or we wanted. Does that sound familiar? Has anyone had a similar situation for that happen in the past? It happens all the time, because we set ourselves up for failure. A website, and any online marketing, to be frank, is nothing more than a magic money machine. I literally used this exact terminology when I did this for Fortune 500 clients at downtown agencies in Minneapolis. I'm from Minnesota, by the way. Which has a blizzard right now. My wife is snowed in. She's been on the roof for three days. So I'm happy to be here. So, um, it's a magic money machine. That's all it is. And it's a magic money machine that we have to tune to make more money come out. And I ask a client, hey, if I can prove to you every dollar I stick in this magic money machine I can stick out two dollars, how many dollars would it give you? Well, they laugh. And I say, oh, seriously. And then we write a goal. It's a smart goal. It's specific, measurable, attainable, and time-specific. So that in a year from now, we know, yes or no, if this website project was a success. You take all subjectivity out of it. Because guess what? Here's the secret. Clients don't care about design. They don't. They care about their results. They might like how the site looks and want it to look pretty and all that. But at the end of the day, every client has a purpose. Every website is a KPI. And that KPI might be page views or engagement. It might be traditional sales. It might be stickiness on the site. It might be how it interacts with other elements of maybe a media campaign or things like that. But if we don't write down these goals, you're never going to know if they're successful or not. And that's where A-B testing can help you win. Because if you can say at the beginning to a client, this website's not going to be perfect, but we're going to test it and adjust it and make it better and tune this magic money machine to make your results better. And we're gonna make we're gonna hit our goals every single month and we can prove it. Then they're gonna be paying you every single month. Residual income is amazing on A-B testing, and clients love to do it because you're doing nothing but increasing their results. You're just increasing their results. So it has to be controlled. Um, with that, um, what I recommend is uh, you use a tool like BWO or Optimizely um, or AB Tasty, was that what you want to use? And there's lots of WordPress plugins out there. I'm not here to say one plugin is better than the other. Find a tool that works for you because it's going to do the results for you. It's going to make sure it's statistically relevant. Anyone here have a doctorate in applied data analysis? Wait, you guys don't have a PhD in data science and you're in the web field? Well, you should just quit right now. Why are you doing your job? Nobody knows the stuff that you need to know. Actually, I did this talk once, and this guy raised his hand. It was like Riverside. And he raised his hand, he's like, yep, Harvard. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, here's the mic. 
But here's the thing, guys, is did you know that websites, when you do tests, there's margins of error? Do you know there's all these different things that can affect it? I'll give you an example. I had a client that was like, oh my god, my results are this much, month over month. I'm like, great. What did you do? Well, I did all these changes, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. How are the year over year? What? They were comparing September, uh, sorry, October through November. They're in retail. <laughs> Guess what happens in November? People buy stuff. Because it's the holiday season. And year over year, they were 20% down. But they don't look at the big picture. That is why tools like VWO, Optimize Lead, or anything else out there will do the work for you. They'll tell you if the test you're doing is a winner or a loser, or you need to keep testing. And the crazy stuff works sometimes. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, the kind of the crazy different tests. Um, do micro testing. So when you were doing your test, we were only changing usually one element at a time, or were you doing multivariant? Uh, we started out with just one element, just to keep it simple, like we were doing. Okay. And then the more we got to do this. So does anyone here know the difference between microvariant and single variant testing? No. So here's the main difference. So let's say you have a button, right? And that button has two colors. We'll say red and green as the two different colors of your test. Um, if you are just testing the different colors, that would be a single variant because you're only testing the color of the button. But let's say you were testing it, you know, where you had one test that the button was green, but also a different font. That would be two variants on that one specific test. Um, I highly recommend, highly, highly, highly recommend to start with single variant testing because multivariant testing can get very confusing very quick. And here's the truth very few of you in this room have enough traffic to sustain multivariant testing. Um, I am, don't even touch multivariant testing in most cases unless the client is pushing at least 5,000 daily visitors. Quite honest. Um, that's why single variant testing allows you to focus on a single element. We're going to talk about what you can test in a little bit. So, what to test? So, what are different things you can test on a website? We talked about buttons and fonts. So, what are other things? Same draft. So, layout. Great. Photos. Photos. What? Sorry. Call to action. Call to action. CTA. CTA. Copy. Copy, copywriting, photos, great. It's all amazing ideas. And here's the thing that so many people sit down with me. And they're like, I don't know what to test. I don't know what to test. My website's perfect. <laughs> I am an expert. I know what I'm doing. I did the best practices for the internet. And I know all the internet. So I don't need to test. Here's the results. Here's the here's the dirty little secret in our industry. You guys ready? We're guessing. We are guessing. Every single one of us are guessing. Period. I am not going to say that your expertise and your experience and the best user case and the case studies and the white papers and all of the experience you have is not valid. It is. It's extremely valid. But it's what gets you started. You need to then use that as a launchpad site because every set of users are completely different. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you do not know who is visiting that website as intimately as you think you do. And I'm going to talk about some crazy examples that are going to prove this point to the extreme a little bit later. And I definitely guarantee your clients don't know who is visiting their website. I had a client, it was a food company. They were convinced that. It was college students and contributors that were buying this food company. They were convinced of it. The whole marketing strategy behind this. Well, guess what? No one was buying it. Not as much as they should have been. They were doing ad campaigns in Marvel movies, product placements. And so we started looking at it. You know who's busy in the website? Not colleges. Single family mothers. Because it was a natural food product had no added sugar. So guess what? We changed our strategy and we started doing some tests to the single family homes. And guess what? Sales went up. 
You know why they thought it was college students? Because the marketing manager just graduated from college six months ago. And his dad is the owner of the company, and guess what he had in his dorm room? This product. And we all laugh at that, but it happens all the time. It happens all the time where we think we know everything. And guess what? We, then we don't. And testing is a way to get paid to make your client's website perform better. It's good for your client. You owe it to your client's users. And you get paid for it. What's not the like? Um, anyone here familiar with HubSpot? Probably, right? Yeah. Anyone here at HubSpot Agency? No? Okay. Um, so HubSpot now teaches their agencies to do a, a method called Growth Driven Design, GDD. And Growth Driven Design is a fancy word for testing. They launch a launchpad site and then they do monthly iterations based on tests to make it better. Those agencies that do Growth Driven Design make 86% more revenue than their agencies that don't. It's just A-B testing with a fancy name. Luke Summerfield, um, he's actually a friend of mine, uh, he's the guy who wrote it. He's the director of education over at HubSpot. It's the same thing. But if you tell the client from the beginning that testing's a requirement for the project, they're not gonna fight you on it. And you're gonna prove the data that it's worthwhile to them. I see a lot of people that say, well, I can't convince the client to do testing. Well, then he didn't do a good job at the beginning of the sales cycle. He didn't set their expectations right. How many times does this happen with a client? You meet with a client and they say, last time we made a new website was four years ago. Ah, it took forever, it took six months, and we had all these meetings, and it took all this time, and it just it was just a really bad experience. And we finally got the website done, then we didn't touch it again. <coughs> until, until I called you, and you're gonna solve everything, and build me another new website, until I'm not, I don't touch that again for four years. Everyone's in this two to four year website cycle. It's silly. It's a waste of money, and guess what? The clients don't like it any better. Sit down with the client and say, you'll never have to make a new website again. This will be the last website you're ever gonna launch. Because you're gonna do iterative testing every single month and make these adjustments based on data. <coughs> Data-driven decisions, that's all that matters is data. And they're gonna get better results and their website is gonna look dramatically different 24 months after you launch it. Think about when you launch a new website as a launch pad site. So what's going to start the project, but it's not the end of the project. You set this expectation from the beginning. And it's so much fun to test. You can have so much fun with A-B tests. I'll talk about some fun examples. So what can you test? Buttons. You can test so many things with the buttons. Colors, fonts, style, size, drop shadow. Uh, drop shadows. So I once had a client, National Insurance Company. Their KPI was quote requests. Okay, quote quote for their insurance. We increased their insurance quote by 80%. I tested everything. I hired expert UI and UX experts out there. We had we had focus groups. We had everything. We had copywriters. Everything was performing badly. I tried a two pixel drop shadow. Two pixels. 80% lift. I didn't believe it. I ran another 50,000 users through the test. Same result. Tried it on a different page. Another 200,000 users through this test. Same result. A two pixel drop shadow gave them 80% more quote requests. Can anyone guess why? Why that would be the reason? Anyone have any guess? It's attractive. It's attractive. See the button. Does it look more like a button? Look more like a button. Why can you compress it? Okay, compress it. Okay, great. What was, what was the increase in the Eighty percent. Here's the reason. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't matter. All I give it junk about is the data. Is the data? I don't care about data. <laughs> I don't care. If you try to find reasoning why users use the internet, you're going to go crazy. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me on this. You don't know what's in people's heads. Now, you do want to look at it and look at general case studies and general user behaviors, and then try it again. There are things that most people do interact with, but every set of users is a little bit different. Um, that's why we talk about this talk. Which way does your duck face? There was a case study. There was a picture of a duck, and it was married. The left-facing duck converted like, like 70 
test, okay, converted 70% less than the right facing duck. And I always ask the question, why? And they say, well, because the beak is pointing to the call to action, or, um, or the duck is forward looking. And then every five talks, and look, I have over 30 of these recorded online, you can watch them and see them yourself. Riverside was the last time it happened. Um, What's well, because the duck is looking into the future? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, and I don't care. It's because it's data. So we got buttons, we got text. We can test so many things with text. The font, the size, the style, the case, copywriting. Professional copywriting versus non-professional copywriting. Do you know there are sets of users that perform better with spun content than if you have a professional copywriter write something? It's true. It is really true. I once had a client thank me so many for writing all of their copy for them. They were so thankful they could launch their website. It was corporate Ipsum. <laughs> and this was a company that had millions and millions and millions of dollars on management. Everyone interacts with websites way differently than you think they do. So text, you can test so many different things with the text. I like to call to action, like you said earlier. Images, you can test so many different things on the images. Uh, who here uses stock photos? Who here refuses to use stock photos? And of those of you, who's a photographer? <laughs> Here's the thing, guys, is sometimes stock photos perform way better, way better than original photography. And there are sets of users that perform really badly with stock photos. And you can get into all these case studies about education and all this stuff, but guess what? I test it. I just test it. If the results show that a, that, a, that a stock photo performs better than an original photo, I'll use the stock photo. And guess what? Clients, even though know they might say they want original photography, you, prove, you, give, you show them the money, you show them that their KPIs are working more, they will stop caring about originality real quick. Now, I'm not saying original photography is bad. There are lots and lots of cases where stock photos just perform really, really badly. But it's not a binary thing. This is not something you do 100% of the time. Otherwise, it's it's this way or the highway. And I know it. I know the right answer every single time. And if you, for those of you that can't afford original uh, photography, there are stock photo companies that specialize in non-stock looking stock photos, um, which is kind of fun. Um, you can test everything. You can test every single thing. And testing doesn't even have to be on the website. So here's where I get a little political. So let's talk about the presidential campaign and how they did A-B testing. Oh, yeah. This is the part where it gets dangerous. I did do this in Texas two days after, two weeks after the election, though, and I didn't, I'm still here, so. <laughs> so, we'll talk, I promise I'll talk about both parties. We'll talk about Donald Trump first. Two weeks before the election, the week before the election, one of the most successful fundraising campaigns the Donald Trump campaign ever did. They had a thing where you could donate money and your name would be on their website or their Facebook page. Okay, fine. I might not personally want to give money to that organization, uh, but I get what they're doing. You own a piece of the campaign, but the Democrats do the same thing. Right? Now, if you were hired to do that, how would you technically solve that? You know, people want to donate money and their name appears on the website, like it's a ticker, like Joe gave 20 bucks from Ohio or something. What would be some technical ways you could solve it? Assuming you took the job, what would be some technical <laughs> ways you could solve that? You can do JavaScript, you can have fancy video, you can have Flash, you can have a donation page. There's all these ways you can do that. And here's the thing. We can all agree that Donald J. Trump cares about his brain. And for those of you that think these crazy ideas, I can't do it because my client's brain is too important, we can all agree that the president cares about his brain. I think that's something that is just that's pretty safe. Here's what they did. The week before the election, we have, based on the donation reports, we don't know exactly how much, but it seems to be one of the most successful fundraising campaigns he ever did. People donated money live on the website, and it shot to a live webcam laser printer, printing out names 10 at a time. This is not a third party group. This is not a political action committee. This is Donald J. Trump's official Facebook page. Everyone laughs at this and says, oh, look, he's so disconnected. For those of you that don't think this was deliberate, you are solely, solely mistaken. Millions and millions and millions of dollars are raised. And guess what? Every political party hires companies to do their online fundraising. They get commission. I know, because I used to work for one. 
this was completely deliberate because they knew who they were going after. They tested it. They did something very similar for the convention, but it was very like highly produced. Get your name on the Megatron at you know at the nominated convention, and it was super polished. That also did well for them, not nearly as well as this from what we know. And this went on the week before the election. I had this up on my computer for eight solid hours. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And every once in a while, they had a handwritten note that said, here's how you donate. And you would see a disembodied hand come down from the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, please put all those thoughts away saying my client's too important. I've done this for eight, I've done crazy ideas for Fortune 500s, and the president, who is our current president, who we all can agree cares about his brand, <laughs> right? Um, because he has hotels and chains and ties and everything. <coughs> if you acknowledge me that his fans according to him, he was able to do it and survive. Um, and raise a lot of money. Hillary Clinton does similar things. One of the tests that she was doing a lot before the election is they would do, they would change the homepage, like how much you would default to donate when you click on it. One of the most successful ones, and they did different things, like book authors, like a copy of the book with signatures. And, what was very successful for that one was donate money and maybe meet me for dinner and things like that, or go see Hamilton with me, and they did a lot of tests related really. to that. Again, same companies. Not necessarily the same company, but very similar companies that can pay commission follows. So, what is my crazy list? So this is literally the A-B testing list that I use, and I'll show you how to get a copy of the book I got this from at the end. Professional versus unprofessional. So everyone's like, oh no, I can't make an unprofessional website. What about my reputation? And here's the thing. You can make an unprofessional website that still meets brand standards. And here's why I just give the caveat. Please, please, please pass all tests by your client before you make them live. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, uh, it might not turn out so well. Although I have been guilty of just doing tests without asking, but I shouldn't have done that. Um, but professional, unprofessional. There are times unprofessional websites work. There are times where no images on the page convert way better. Has anyone ever gotten one of those fundraising letters, those eight-page ones that ask you to save the unicorns or something, that have like scribbles in the margins? And I'm not saying it's not an important cause. I've personally never seen a unicorn, so I think they need to be saved. But there are certain people that those direct response letters convert. And there are certain people that don't. That do they convert less than they did maybe in the 80s? Probably, but they still send them out because they still convert. Same goes for the web. There's a reason why you sometimes land on a website and it's one of those direct response landing pages that goes on for a million miles and has screenshots of someone's PayPal account. And look how much money I made in 24 hours. And here's testimonials. And um, at the, lo the longer you scroll, the better the offer gets. And you know, buy this ebook right now. I was just at the ClickFunnels conference, um, which is a software that makes landing pages. Um, they had like 250 people that made direct response pages in the last 12 months make over a million dollars in revenue just using their software, doing this, doing this model. So sometimes unprofessional does work. Um, photo versus illustration. New stock illustration, hire a designer. Sometimes photos aren't always the best thing. One color versus another color. Test the colors. And when you test the colors, test the test of successful colors. Um, does anyone here know what WCAG 2.0 is? Okay. So it's an accessibility standard. In there, they have AA, AAA. They have contrast ratios that are mathematically set for accessibility. So when you test your colors, test your contrast ratios. Not only is it good for accessibility, which one in three American adults suffers from something covered under that standard, it also is good for results. Because guess what? If people can see what your offer is, they usually opt into it more. It's amazing, it's really weird. Um, low brightness contrast versus high brightness contrast. Sometimes over blowing it out works. And I know the designers in the room are cringing, but here's the thing, it's not about you. We are really cocky in this industry. We like to play God. You ever wonder why Wix Weekly and Squarespace is doing so well? It's because people historically don't like dealing with web designers. They've been burned in the past, they feel scammed. They feel like they're not in there for their best interests. And I'm sure that's nobody in this room, but we all agree that there have been people in our industry that have done not the best for our reputation. Why do you think do-it-yourself solutions are doing so well? Um, so please, test it. 
And when you test it, don't test all the traffic, just test like five or 10 percent. Use one of those tools and say a subset of this traffic is going to get these tests and let the results win out. And if the results say, yes, this test is over the win success, test it again, maybe on another page. If it then goes up, if it still wins, then great, you found a winner, implement it. Border versus no border, what do you sell explanatory? Blurry image versus clear image. Static versus animation. And if this was moving, you can see the card going. Ugly versus not ugly. Um, there are times where sometimes having really striking photos, um, one way or the other, will give you better results. And there's times that it won't. Especially in the last year, we've noticed the overproduced person is not converting nearly as well, especially for certain demographics. They want to see real people. You know, some of the things that's been in the news, we're trying to be more real, more natural, not overly sexualized or any of that sort of stuff. But every set of users are different. Um, static versus interactive. Get 50% off, or you can choose the pizza or the donut to get 50% off. I personally want both, but there's only two. <laughs> Professional stock photo versus amateur informal photo. One layout versus another layout. Let's see, get a, get a start. One call to action versus another call to action. Get your free trial today, or click your internet access. Images versus text only. I know a lot of people really cringe at that. Oh, I can't have a text only thing. Yes, you can. Test it. Here's the most interesting thing is, the fastest growing segment of the internet right now are on browsers that can't display images. <clears throat> the fastest growing segment of the internet are on devices that can't display images. We're talking about the developing world. And for those of you who say, well, that's not my, those people aren't going to my website. Well, think about what your website is. If you provide, here's an example, if you provide data for victims of domestic abuse, maybe you should provide a text only option because maybe they only have a flip phone. We stop making assumptions and we start testing them using the results. Um, upgrade versus angled. Flooded versus blue underline text. There's our friend the drop shadow, a regular border versus a false border and drop shadow. I love drop shadows. <laughs> uh, custom ad design versus familiar UI elements. Um, familiar UI elements are something you can implement. Have you ever wondered that Facebook now started doing the menu at the bottom of your, of your phone because the devices are getting so big? Now a lot of websites are mimicking the bottom menu look because the hamburger is physically too far away to reach. Very similar with that. I am not saying to lie and say you're your Facebook, but you take some of those ideas. Original image versus mirror image is our friend the duck again. One font size style case versus another font size style case, very easy to test. Standard ad shape like a rectangle or a custom ad shape like a circle. Or in today's internet, standard ad shape like a circle or a custom ad shape like a rectangle. Positive versus negative, want to fall in love with your spouse again. I'm sick of fighting with your spouse. And it can be work sometimes. I once had a client, they um, were a product that stopped stove fires. Guess what? You know what worked? Your mom will leave the stove unattended and will die because stove fires are the number one cause of house.